it's 101. So I think we probably have everyone here that's joining today. Um, let me start off and let me change my view here so we have the chat up. And then maybe I'll wait. I see a few more people popping in, so I might wait to share um, the recipe. Totally awesome. Can you watch the game online? You can. Um, they're on YouTube. Um, you can type in the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament, and you can watch. Um, a good one to watch is the Louisville game, um, which gets us into the Final Four, and then um, everything thereafter. You can find all the games there. For those of you who are just joining us, um, welcome to today's class. Um, I was just talking with everyone and introducing my daughter who um, happens to be in town for a few days. And um, they just happened to win the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament one week ago yesterday. So we're still riding that wave and um, high as a kite on that. Um, we're just so excited for the, that whole group of ladies and their coaches. It, they're an incredible bunch um, who have gone through so much adversity this year with COVID restrictions. I could talk to you guys about what they've had to do. And so it's just super special that they were able to win and it was close each game. I won't spoil it for those of you who haven't seen the games, but they are um, sure fun to watch. And uh, we got to be there and be a part of it. And speaking of which, that's why I was gone. And so you guys got to see, hopefully, Carrie um, Rigor. She did um, that coconut Thai or Thai coconut um, soup. And then last week, of course, was Jessica. And I'm sure um, she was live after the video. And she's just a blast. And I'm sure you got to experience her that way. Um, she's so much fun and just a treat. And if you haven't seen those, um, hopefully you guys will be able to check those out sometime. Um, I'm sure they'll be up on the website um, at the Pikes Peak Library um, soon and uh, you guys can enjoy them. But I, I, I just um, am so grateful to them for helping. If you love what they shared with you, please give them a shout out. You know, we do these classes solely out of service. You know, we don't get paid for them or anything. It's just from our heart and um, to help folks. And so please give them a shout out and say thank you because I'd love for them to do this again um, sometime. And so um, I made all the recipes um, this past week which made dinner so easy because I knew exactly what I was gonna try. And so it was fun. And so I hope you try them and share your photos. We had a few people who shared this past week. So that was fun. Um, and so today we're here and I'm crazy excited to share this with you. Um, we're making Not Your Mama's Pasta. <laughs> and I called it that because, you know, typically pasta recipes um, are all about pasta. And this one is not going to use pasta. And I'm sure as you guys saw from the supply list, you already know what our swap is. And that is actually spaghetti squash. And so I discovered spaghetti squash, um, actually it was during uh, COVID. So it was in 2020, believe it or not. And it was because of my husband. Um, we were doing, I shared with you guys a while back that uh, we did this COVID challenge is what we called it. I got tired of cooking. <laughs> like many of you, I'm sure get tired of cooking at some point or another. And my family hopped in and said, let's make it a contest. We'll each make a meal each night of the week. We'll judge it and base it on presentation and originality. And it just so happened my husband picked this particular dish that I am showing you guys today. And I fell in love with it and I have been using it ever since. Um, so I want to know, hear from you guys. Have you guys used spaghetti squash before? I see some people shaking their head, other people, yes. Okay. So the people who have used it, you know what I'm talking about when you say how, when I say how good this is. And then for those who haven't tried it, you're probably like me, you're intimidated by it, or you just don't really know about it. You don't see it in the grocery store maybe, and it's just not on your radar. Um, 
but I think you're going to love it as much as I do and our family does. And it is such an amazing swap for pasta. And I know, I don't know if uh, Debbie's on today or not. Um, you know, she had talked before how um, she was wanting like more healthful type recipes, healthy recipes. And you can't get any better than this because a, it's probably, I would say a cup of pasta is probably 250 calories. This entire thing is 220 calories. And if you're only having a cup of it, we're talking 30 to 40 calories and that's it. So it's a super great swap if you're trying to just limit things or just introduce bright and colorful things into um, you know, your dinner meals um, it's, and it's fun. So I personally um, hadn't dealt with squash a lot over the years. And you know, what I think it came down to is I didn't like to cut it because it's actually, they're hard to cut. They're dangerous as all get out to cut. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few tricks on that um, as we go here. And um, I think, I don't know when it was, I saw John's on today. Hi, John. Um, he had asked a great question on our Facebook page not too long ago. He asked about sharpening knives, where to get them done or what to use to sharpen them. And so I had posted a picture and if you guys are interested, you can go and look. It was just, um, we have the box from when we bought our sharpener. Um, but one of the, the secrets really of any chef in the kitchen is a sharp, sharp knife. A dull knife is one of the most dangerous things you can have in your kitchen, believe it or not. <laughs> um, because a dull knife, I mean, can cause a lot of problems when you're slicing and you'll just find that you'll fall in love with a very sharp knife. And so John had asked about what I use and we use an electric knife sharpener now. We have a manual one. Um, I can show you what that looks like. And you just slide your blade down to sharpen it. Um, so we use that, but the electric sharpener is something we've used for years and years and years. Um, and so I highly recommend that. And then you don't have to worry about taking it somewhere. Um, I see some, let's look here. Some things. I made the shrimp tacos last night and the Chipotle chili pepper seasoning was heavenly. And yes, Susan says on the spaghetti squash. Mary, it's been a great alternative to standard noodles, easy to cook in an Instapot too. Oh, that's good. I don't have an Instapot, but I've heard a lot about them. And how do you pick a good spaghetti squash? I like to eat it, but don't know how to pick a good one. You don't have to know actually how to pick a good one. I think they're all fairly consistent. You don't, I mean, the outside of them, I mean, if it's soft, I would not buy it but they're all hard on the outside. They're a light yellow color, um, but for the most part, there's nothing that you have to physically see um, other than that it looks like a, a good squash, meaning that there's no big spots anywhere that may look like it's rotten or anything like that. Um, so that makes it super simple. And nowadays you can buy them anywhere. I get mine at Sprouts and what I like is that they're always there. I never have to guess whether the store is gonna have them in stock or not. And John said, I think the stone rod is really for honing. I Googled and there's an interesting difference between honing and sharpening. And that in fact is true. And that's why we have the electric sharpener to keep them sharp at all times. It's just basically to doctor it up a little bit if you just need a quick little um, sharpening and um, the manual tool. But the electric sharpener has worked really well and um, make sure you have a sharp knife if you're dealing with a squash would be <laughs> tip number one. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can slice this. Um, a lot of people will say, you know, cut and make it level so it's not rocking around. Typically, if you just set it down and let it wobble, it'll find a balance point. So you really don't have to worry about slicing it and finding a level section. Um, another thing is there's two ways to cut it. You can cut it down, straight down the middle this way and break it open. And what that does, it creates a longer strand that looks like a noodle. 
And a lot of people think it's this way that you're gonna cut it. Well, I personally cut mine this way, long ways, only because I like the shorter strand. And that way you're getting more bite-sized pieces. They're about four inches typically. Um, but if you cut this direction in half, then the noodles run around this direction, the strands do. And so you're gonna get the full circumference of your squash when you do that. So you can do either way. And you know, I'm praying right now that I don't uh, cut myself. <laughs> so I'm gonna pay close attention to what I'm doing. So if I'm not looking at you guys, um, that is why. And so I usually start toward the end and this is a pretty sharp knife and I just wait for it to crack and then I'll flip it and always keep your fingers back. And it's good to lean into it too and use your body and not just stand back from it, like lean into it and put some weight into it when you cut it. And then it will crack open. And actually as you're cutting, if you get that first little crack, I would recommend that you not push your knife all the way down through because that's another thing where it can slip and you can you know, cut your finger. Um, but once you get that first little crack, you can also knock it onto your um, cutting board and it will crack and you can peel it open like this. And it's very similar, just like any squash, it has a seeds inside, so like a pumpkin. And we're just gonna scrape those out. And I just use a spoon to do it. And it's so funny because uh, after um, when Jess and I did the uh, filming for last week's Shrimp Tacos, I realized like I'm much more of a technical person like when I teach and she's so funny and she can incorporate stories as she talks. And I'm like, how in the world do you do that? <laughs> she has, you know, she's quite a talent. So, so fun. So you just scrape those and I'm gonna dump them in my sink here. And you certainly can save the seeds if you want, just like you would pumpkin seeds and roast them. And I never mind, I don't know if you guys can see, I don't mind leaving some of the strands in there. And the final tip I wanna give you guys, if you do not feel comfortable with the knife set you have being sharp, keep it whole and roast it whole. And then after an hour, it'll be softer on the outside and then you can use that knife to cut it. But the thing is, it does take longer to, um, if you're gonna do it whole. Um, what I like about this particular recipe too is that you literally put it in the oven, you leave it, you can prep your sauce, you're done. So it's a super, super easy meal. I'm going to grab a 9 by 13 pan, and I know people have commented, um, oh yes, thank you, Maria. I started to do that, uh, share the recipe earlier, and then I saw people hopping in on the call, and I got distracted. Thank you for keeping me on track there. So you guys have the recipe link now for this. I'll make it a little bit easier to follow on. Thank you for that. That's good. Okay, so I typically use a 9 by 13. You can use a cookie sheet too if you want, but I like that it kind of keeps it all in place here. And all we do is take some olive oil. And I say in the recipe a couple of tablespoons, and I'm lit literally just drizzling it over the top. And just, I make sure that most of it's covered. And then just grab salt and sprinkle. I'm using kosher salt. And that is uh, super important because if you're using iodized, don't use as much because it's much sharper. So about a tablespoon. And so we just add that over the top of the squash. And then we grab some um, fresh thyme. 
And I just take a couple of sprigs here and sprinkle it in. And my favorite thing too about this recipe, and, and I probably say it all the time to you guys, is my favorite recipes, and I mentioned it last week, are the simplest of recipes that just use simple ingredients. I, I don't think cook, cooking should be that complicated. Um, and I feel like it gets overcomplicated sometimes and just the simplest of things make for the best dish. And so this particular dish is all about teaching you guys how to layer with flavor. So we start, it's no different than like building a house, so to speak. You start with a good foundation, right? And then you add layer upon layer as you build something. And so I think of cooking the exact same way and so this is all just about small flavor, layers of flavor as we go. So this is just olive oil, salt, and some fresh thyme. And literally I've used what, two or three sprigs of thyme and that's it. And then the next thing we're gonna do is put tin foil over it. And I hey, out today. Um, yeah, John. If I have dried thyme instead of fresh, how much should I use? Um, I would say about a teaspoon. Yeah, and spread that across them. Yep. Okay, thank you. And so I brought this out today because you guys know I talk about my um, big thing of uh, saran wrap. Well, I also do the big thing of uh, tin foil at the big box stores. And the reason I do it is because it's as wide as a cookie sheet. And so you don't have to layer, you guys know the trick, like when you use a small roll of tin foil, how you have to fold it together and then make it wide enough to fit. Well, all these are the exact size of a sheet, of a cookie sheet. And you know, you can make it as long or as little as you want, but it just makes life so much easier. And so I just highly recommend it. So I wanted to show you guys that. And it, it's a lot thicker, I think too. It doesn't tear easily. So I already started a um, second or a, a batch of uh, squash earlier. So it'd be done in time for class. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add this to it. I still have about seven minutes there. And I'm gonna put on my other timer so I don't forget it later. Okay, so it's gonna go into an oven on 425. So those of you who are baking along, just make sure you preheat your oven to 425 degrees. And you're gonna put it in, start off with an hour um, but set your timer for about 30 minutes and it's gonna have the tin foil over top. We'll remove the tin foil and then let it cook for another 30 minutes. I typically actually cook it for an additional 40 minutes is my magic number. So it's an hour and 10 minutes in the oven. And you know, if yours are a little smaller than what I have, um, then it may only take the um, hour and I'll show you guys when we pull this out, how you'll be able to tell um, if it's done or not, but it's gonna range anywhere from an hour to an hour and 10 minutes. So while that's in there, um, we'll make our sauce and you can't get any easier than using jarred sauce, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna talk to you guys about that in a minute. So think about what your favorite jarred spaghetti sauce is and share that with all of us. Um, but one of the flavor profiles that we're going to use, and I was going to be outside today, but it's a little chilly. Um, I was going to use the grill outside, um, and I decided just to bring it in. And we had made grilled sausages this weekend, so I'm cheating, and I just have leftovers. Why not use leftovers? Um, so I already have my um, sausages that were grilled up. But for those of you who are baking along, if you have a grill, preheat that and get that hot, or you can put it on the stove and grill your sausages up if you have a grill pan. If you don't have a grill pan, that's okay. Um, you can also put it on a cookie sheet 
put it in your oven on 375 for 20 minutes, flip them, and then cook it for another 10 minutes or so. Um, I love a grill pan, especially for during the winter and because you're not outside you know, on a grill for the most part. Some people are. I don't typically like to go out in the snow, but that's just me. Um, but for those of you who do, then you can just use an outdoor grill. But all you're doing, there's no magic there with um, the sausages. You're just grilling them on all sides. Um, I, I thought I'd show you guys. I love the ones at Costco that um, this is Tarantino's mild sausage. And I'm sure they sell them other places or other grocery stores, but they come in packs of six and um, they're in groups, I think of 12. So you get 24 in a bunch. And so you just peel off this little section and you literally just throw them on the grill. And I like the flavor of them. They're not overly spicy or anything. It's just a mild Italian sausage. But yeah, I have my sausage here, so I'm just gonna set that to the side. But for those of you who are grilling your sausages, go ahead and get those started. And you're just browning them on either side for the most part until they're heated all the way through. So that's one of our other flavor profiles that we're adding in. And then our next one is gonna be bell peppers. And I know you guys, when you read the recipe or saw the supply list, Everyone's thinking, oh my gosh, this is like the easiest recipe in the world. And she's just going to add bell peppers to the spaghetti sauce and think that that's going to add something. Well, I'm going to do a little bit something more. I love this trick. I do it almost any time I use bell peppers. And that is to roast them. And you can do them lots of different ways. And I'll explain that as we go. But the first thing you want to do is wash these up and then dry them off completely. You don't wanna have them wet at all because you're gonna be putting them on heat and it'll make them pop even more. And, um, so I would definitely recommend to wash them up and get them super dry. So mine are dry here. And because we're not outside on the grill today, I'm just gonna use my stove to put these on. And you wanna put it on a medium high heat and I just put mine literally right on top of the grill there. And that's it. And you're going to blacken every side of your pepper. Now, if you, do not worry if you don't have a gas stove. Um, I, I put, made the recipe for a grill because most everyone has a grill for the most part. And you can easily do this on a grill. And, you're looking for those black darkened layers on every side. But if you don't have, if you have an electric stove, um, then do it in the oven, but just know it takes longer. You'll have to do it on, um, if you roast at 375 or 400, it's about 20 minutes and then you flip them. I usually have them and then you flip them over and it's another 20 minutes. So it's gonna take 40 minutes of your time to do it. But roasted peppers, for all of you who are fans out there, they're the best. Um, they add like the, a smoky flavor. Um, it it's just adds a special depth of flavor. And I personally don't ever buy green peppers anymore. I, I don't personally like them. <laughs> but I love, love, love yellow, red, and orange peppers. And for those of you who don't typically buy them, just try them. They taste so much better. Then the green pepper, they're just mild, they're sweet. Um, I think it's more of a common thing that people use, but um, in case you haven't tried the more colorful ones, please give them a try. And I'm literally leaving them. You'll, did you guys hear them crackling and popping a little bit as I was talking? No, I guess I could probably hear it, but you see that it's blackening. And so you just turn it over and you let it go. and I personally, you'll see if you roast them in the oven, they can get soft and it's fine to go to the point where they're soft. I actually like them if you'll just squeeze your um, pepper where it has some give to it and it's not super mushy because then you lose your texture a little bit. So my oven is going off for the um, squash right now. So let me grab a fork. 
I told you guys, the way that you're going to tell is if you need to do this for an additional 10 minutes or so is grab a fork and you're just going to scrape. You can start to scrape and then you can poke around. And if it feels like it's not tender, put it on for another five minutes or so. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, and we'll see what it looks like then. It's going to be super soft, uh, the squash. And um, I'll show you when this one's done and um, what you can look for when we pull that out. Let's see here. Bell peppers are great. Yes, fresh snack, cooked and roasted, so versatile. My kids even like them. Yes, it's a win-win, isn't it, Just, <laughs> I agree. Um, it, it, I love them just because they're crisp and you can dip them in anything if you don't want to use chips and you're looking for something with crunch. Um, it, it, I love having these. I almost always have a bunch of them on hand. And so just keep flipping your peppers And you can also do it in a skillet as well and continue to flip them and they move around too. On the grill, it works a little bit better. But in a pinch, this works great. And I would say it probably takes anywhere like seven minutes, 10 minutes on average to keep turning them around. Until they're all the way cooked, maybe even 10 minutes. And just be careful because if your um, stove is hot there, I have told you guys before, my hands don't really respond to heat as much anymore. So my kids probably couldn't turn them. But use tongs or a pot holder um, to turn it if you need to. And you'll hear it just start crackling and popping. And some of the sides are getting black, like what we want. And you should, the smell of them, whoever is cooking along with us, um, huge difference. You can tell immediately that it's going to change the flavor of the pepper just by the smell alone. And Susan, it said, do you ever roast tomatoes the same way on the gas stove? Actually, I have not. Have you, Susan? With your tomatoes? No, I haven't. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm afraid. I get too much heat. No. Yeah, the smoky flavor, I, I'm sure there's a way to do it. And I think that um, if you do it in slices in the oven, where you're kind of drying them out a little bit, um, probably works a little bit better, um, is my guess. But I haven't done it on the stove, no, in the same way. Yeah, it's worth the shot though, now that I'm thinking about it. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I have one more side that I'm gonna try to get here. And then I'll show you what we'll do. Yeah. So you'll need to grab some paper towels. And I usually grab, probably four and you can use a regular towel too. I, I don't typically use a lot of paper towels but this is one of the things I use them for and this part is important. Um, what we're going to do is once these are blackened we're going to bring them over here and then wrap them up. Let's see this one's closer and that one's closer. There we go. So it's, it's fairly blackened for the most part, as you guys can see. So take your paper towel and wrap it up and that's going to trap all the moisture from the steam. We're basically creating a pocket of steam. And then I'm just going to set this off to the side. And the reason we did that is then it makes peeling the outer layer, that charred layer off super easy. Okay. And so I'll just do that with this last one. 
This one maybe isn't quite as done, but that's all right. And then just wrap it up to paper towel and set it off to the side. And then I heard my timer go off again. So I'm just gonna check the squash here. Yep, I'm gonna go five more minutes on the squash. There we go, okay. So five minutes to go there. So we're gonna take a saucepan and you know, this is a great cheat meal because you just grab a jar of spaghetti sauce and you put it in. Not complicated at all. We can all do this. And I would love to hear from you guys what your favorite spaghetti sauce is. And then I'll share my favorite here, Rao's vodka sauce. Anyone else have a favorite? We're using Victoria Marinara. Yep, heard of that one too. Just regular tomato sauce. Yep. Yeah, it's so fun to hear because usually people have a particular favorite that they like to use. I have found, I like Sprouts brands, um, just their generic. Um, Rouse is at Costco, um, and Melissa had mentioned about their vodka um, sauce, which is delicious. And Karina is showing us furs, Classico. Yep. Yeah, it's so fun because I think sometimes we get stuck using the same things. So I think it's fun for us to maybe hear of others and give those a, a shot. And so I'm a creature sometimes of habit and I just, yeah, grab. And so I thought it'd be fun to find out what you guys like and try different things. That's fun. Um, Newman's Saccaroni. Oh, I have not heard of that one. That's Paul Newman's brand, I think, right? I bet that's good. Sometimes I make my own, you know, a lot of you, um, if you make your own spaghetti sauce, do it, most of you make your own spaghetti sauce. It's super simple to make your own spaghetti sauce too. But if you're in a pinch, there's nothing wrong with buying a jar and going for it. I mean, there's nothing like homemade spaghetti sauce, I'll say that. Oh, Corrine said, which one do I use? This is, um, Costco carries it. Um, it's Rao's homemade marinara. And I uh, typically, we have this on hand right now, but funny enough, I was gonna show you my Sprouts brand, but because we had some stuff this weekend, my husband used them, so I didn't have them on hand when I went to pre prepare for today. And so I like their generic organic sauces. Um, you can, I go back and forth between the basil and they also have a, um, oh gosh, now it's escaping me. It might just be a, called a marinara, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and I've had good luck with those. And Susan said her favorites are Newman's or Bertoli's, yep. Awesome, they have tomato basil one that we, like a lot at Costco. Fun, yeah, I'm gonna have to keep my eye out because it's always fun to have those on hand. Um, and hopefully for all of you guys too, you can try it. Okay, so hopefully all of you who are cooking along with us are done with your sausage by now. And all I'm gonna do is just cut up four of these sausage links. And I bet by the time I'm done here, then we'll be able to Pull out our spaghetti squash. And I just thinly slice them. And it's funny, I wanted to change this recipe uh, in a few ways, but I, I tried to pay um, homage to my husband for doing this during the challenge and I'm keeping it to his way. And it truly, beca because it was so simple, I, I was shocked. Um, <laughs> At it because sometimes I like a little bit more flavor here and there with different things, you know, garlic and 
things like that. But I was like, nope, I'm going to do it exactly the way he did it because we loved it. It was so good. It's so fun. So I'm just slicing these up and just make them bite sized pieces. Just add them to the pot, and I swear the longer you let this simmer, the better it gets. And I'm sure all of you who make your own sauce would say the exact same thing. And there is our timer. I'm going to put it on for just a couple of more minutes. That way we have time to slice up our um, bell peppers here. And so typically, then you can just rub the outside of them like I'm doing. Do you see that? And then the skin, the blackened skin, comes right off. And that's why we do that. Wrap them in the paper towel or a towel. We're just basically trapping all that moisture created from that hot steam. And it literally rubs right off. And we're not aiming for perfection on getting all of that off because that's where the flavor is, you guys. So don't feel like you have to, you know, sit there and scrub it so all the blackened pieces are off. Just know that those blackened pieces are a lot of good flavor. And then when I slice it, I just slice an edge and then roll it. Just like this. And then you just get one long strip. And you can toss that. And I usually take off the bottom piece too and save that. So this one wasn't blackened quite as much. But again, do the same thing and wipe off what you can. And then, like I said, I just slice on the outside and then roll it. and just turn it over and there you go. And what's nice is, like I said, this still has some texture. It's not super soft. I mean, you can make them mushy, but I, I don't personally like that. I think you guys would like it a little bit better with some texture to it. Um, but this literally, you could pick it up out of there as well because it's that soft, it'll come right off. And there's my timer again. You guys help me remember to get that as soon as I'm done slicing these. And I just slice them probably a quarter of an inch. And you can make these bite size if you want. If you have kids who are particular about colorful things in their food. I remember those days when the kids were young and they don't like it. You can puree it up too. You can hide it <laughs> in there if you want. But I just like the longer strips personally. And so I'm just chopping them up. And you know, in the recipe, I told you guys you could use one or two squash um, when you do this or two to four bell peppers. The reason being, if I'm gonna go to the trouble of cooking something in the oven for an hour, I might as well do too. And it just saves you um, time in the long run and you can store it. This is a great, great, it's one of my favorite all time lunches it, are these leftovers. And so I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I'm gonna put this over medium high heat. And we'll just get it warmed up there. And now we'll grab this squash. There. there we go. Okay, so just for all of you guys who are putting your, you put your squash in, just remember to check about 30 minutes into it and remove the tin foil. I may, marked my timer for eight minutes um, left, so that'll be 30 minutes in the oven. We're gonna remove the tin foil and let it finish cooking. 
And so I pulled this out. This was in here for an hour and 10 minutes. And you can test it literally just by putting a fork in it. And if it's fork tender, you are good to go. And so for those of you who've never dealt with this, it's so fun because it literally will string into noodles. And you're just going to take your fork and scrape. And it's hot, so if you need to use an oven mitt, grab an oven mitt. And you just scrape all the way down to the skin. And if you want to be fancy, you can serve this in the squash bowl in and of itself if you want. <laughs> I don't. I typically just put it in a, um, a big, like, 9 by 13 size type dish. If we're going to have it family style, those are my favorite type of meals. And it's probably the same for you guys if you have people um, is to serve it family style so everyone can pass and get what they want. And so you just keep scraping until you feel the bottom skin. And then you just pile it up into your dish. And you guys can see it's kind of um, fallen apart a little bit. You can see how soft it, it truly is, the outer shell. And I do try to get every last bit. And I'll show you guys what the inside looks so you can see that I've pretty much scraped it all the way down. And it does not require, if you feel like you're really struggling to get it out of there, put it back in the oven. Um, because it really should come out super easily. There we go. Oops, and I'm gonna turn down, watch the heat on your, on your spaghetti sauce, because as you guys know, if the heat's too high, it'll splatter out and everywhere. And that's another thing is just by sound alone, you can hear that it's getting hot, so that's always fun. Just a good way to, you don't have to pay much attention to it. So this one, you do the exact same thing. And I will just show you, just so you guys know, let me see if I can find that tip I was telling you guys about how you cut it. So this is probably three inches long. So in my world, that's that's bite size. You You won't be swirling it you know, with a fork for the most part, like you would traditional pasta. But if you cut it the other way and you want the longer strands, do that. And that's fun too. Just scrape. And uh, I started to tell you guys that this is one of my all time favorite things to have in the fridge for leftovers um, with the spaghetti sauce, or I actually um, like to keep it plain. If I'm gonna have leftovers, so I'll separate out if I think I'll have any extra. So like the, the batch that I have in there, I'll keep that completely plain because then you can have a ton of fun with the flavors that you add to it. So one of my favorite things to do is make pesto and you take fresh basil, Actually, this is a good trick, is that with um, any type of pesto, it does not matter what kind of herb you use. Cilantro, you can throw thyme in there. Um, have fun playing around with the different flavors, but it's really simple. It's a handful <laughs> of fresh herbs, and then you're gonna add in parm grated Parmesan and um, pine nuts. Usually it's a tablespoon or two of pine nuts. And I usually throw in some garlic and you puree it in a food processor. And then you drizzle in some olive oil at the end. It's usually about a half a cup and then sprinkle some salt and you're done. But that is one of the best things to put on the spaghetti squash um, if you don't want to do a pasta sauce, a, a tomato sauce. I highly recommend that. Let's see, I think I got most of it a little bit more and surprisingly I'm gonna need my pot holder there we go 
And then I just spread it around in the pan like this, so you guys can see. And then I'm gonna trade this out. Inside. Okay, so now I'm going to grab my pasta because it's heated all the way through. Give it a quick stir. And I think now, as you guys are getting to know me, I, I'm such, I should have showed you at the beginning. I put everything in our little bowl here, here but the yellow of the squash, the orange and the yellow and red of the bell peppers. It just makes for a happy dish. And so you're happy making it. And then you can see in the pasta sauce, it's just a lot of color. It's like a rainbow of color. And you just spread it across the top of your spaghetti squash. So we started, remember, with the, the thyme, the fresh thyme, and the olive oil and salt on the squash. And now we just have truly your favorite spaghetti sauce, along with some sliced mild sausage, and then some roasted bell peppers. And then our last thing, let me just wipe this up a little bit. And then the last thing is we're just gonna take a bunch of fresh herbs and add that to the top. And so I just have some packets here of fresh oregano and you're just gonna sprinkle that over the top. And you'll find, you guys, um, you can add this to a pasta sauce um, at the start if you want, but if you're using fresh herbs, it's typically better to add it at the end versus the beginning. If you're using dried, you can add it pretty much any time. But definitely with fresh, add it at the end. So a couple stemfuls of oregano and then grab a bunch of basil. And, you know, for me, you can either cut these, roll these and julienne them in strips, or I just pick off the leaves and do that. And then I clip off the end pieces, the stems, and then just break it up into bite-sized pieces and sprinkle it around. There we go. And my timer is going off. So all of you who have your spaghetti squash in the oven, now's the time to remove the tin foil. And that just helps it get, um, it just basically browns it a little bit. And so put your timer back on for about 30, you can check it after 30 minutes. Um, for me, like I told you guys, my magic number is usually 40 minutes. So we added our fresh herbs, so that looks super pretty. And then the last thing that we're adding is um, freshly grated Parmesan. And again, like I told you guys, it's all these subtle little things that make all the difference in a dish. Um, please don't use the canned Parmesan. I know some of you might like it, but just try it this way for, first and just give it a try um, before you do the canned um, because it really, it does make a difference. I mean, canned is good, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking any kind of cheese because <laughs> we all like our cheese, um, but freshly grated Parmesan, this is Parmesan Reggiano. Um, just put that over the top and it's, I don't know how many of you guys use this, but it has a nice salty flavor to it. So I wait until the very end to salt this too. So you just grate it over the top. But yeah, please, please, please give this a shot. Um, you can store this forever. I mean, this is probably for me, six months old. I store it in a baggie in the fridge, you can um, freeze it as well. And then save that rind um, when you're done with it and add it to your pasta. If you make this homemade, your pasta sauce, 
you can add that to it and it adds great flavor. Uh-oh, I just saw the, did I freeze? Oh, am I back? Did you guys hear me while I was talking or no? Oh, you could, okay. Ooh, I saw myself freeze, I'm like, not again. <laughs> um, okay, so I think you guys heard me say that. I store my Parmesan in a plastic bag in the fridge. Um, you can store it in the freezer too. Um, and then Parmesan has that subtle salty flavor. So I wouldn't add any other salt during preparing this dish at all, except at the end. And I literally, just, I put in the recipe, it's about a half of a teaspoon of salt. Just a little bit over the top is all you need, not too much. And that's it. And so it's a super simple, I mean, meal. And it doesn't require you, to, you know, to be fully engaged whatsoever. And you guys saw that it literally took me, what, 15 minutes or so. Had I put on the, the sausages, uh, maybe just a few minutes longer. But if you're doing it out on the grill, you can put the sausage on, you can put the grilled peppers on, and just literally heat up your spaghetti sauce and you're done. Um, but I highly recommend this recipe um, if you guys want to give it a shot, you can see how super pretty it is. Wow. And I'll try it just to see <laughs> how we did with our flavors here. And I know there's some questions coming in, so I'll look at those too. I'm going to try to get a bell pepper. You guys might not want to see that on camera when you try to fit all this. It's so good. Um, the reason I like to taste it too is to be able to describe it to you. With the bell peppers, they're not, like I said, the, they're not mushy, so you, there's a bite in them. So when you bite down in them, you, you taste that you're biting into a, a pepper, and I like that. And I think you guys will too, if they're not overly cooked. Um, but the depth of all those layers of flavor, and it's seasoned just enough with the fresh herbs and the fresh Parmesan and a slight sprinkle of the salt. So you really can't get any easier than that. So I hope you guys try it. The squash, I mean, I'm not gonna tell you that it tastes exactly like pasta because it doesn't, but it has such a mild, mild flavor um, and it's slightly sweet. And the fact that you save a ton on calories, I mean, Pasta dishes are phenomenal and, you know, they're worth investing in for sure. But if you're trying to lighten things up with your meals, this is a great swap. So I highly recommend it. And then you can play around with it. Um, I mentioned how you can make homemade pesto and put that over the top of it. Um, you can also do like a peanut sauce and put that over top, a peanut lime sauce, like a Thai-based sauce of had Thai, um, that's delicious over top of this. So, I mean, really the combinations of what you can do with this are endless. There's a ton of different options and I think you guys will have fun playing with it. And because it's such a mild flavor for the squash, um, it's so nice. I mean, it complements pretty much anything. And what I will say is I had mentioned about having it for lunch. As you guys know, if you've ever, with any kind of pasta, the next day, isn't it even better? And so wait till tomorrow and you have this for lunch, it's even better. <laughs> so, you know, I, I know we're making this in the middle of the afternoon, but if you guys are putting this in your fridge um, and you're heating it up later, it's gonna be that much better. And so let's get to see what you guys have in the chat here. Oh, that's funny. Oh, sorry, I skipped a few. Let me go back up here. So messy. Did you put a little water in the bottom of the squash pan before cooking? I did not. Um, I didn't feel like I needed to add any additional steam to that. And that's one of the reasons we cover it at the beginning. Carrot top pesto too. Oh, carrot top pesto. That's a brand that you use. 
I haven't heard of that brand. I will have to look. And then John said, brave to wear a white jacket with red tomato sauce. Yeah, you guys probably noticed I, I did stand back a little bit because we all know the splattery <laughs> of that. Yeah, I probably do have it on me, maybe. No. <laughs> Let's see. Jeff said, I once tried fresh grated. There's no going back. I'll agree with that too. Um, I haven't had the the canned Parmesan for many years for that reason. You guys will notice, I buy mine at, at Costco. It's probably the cheapest place you can buy Parmesan. Parmesan's expensive, um, but you don't use a lot of it. It's a tablespoon or two at a time. And so that's why I said it will last you a long time. You might be investing in a block that could be, it ranges 10 to $16, but it will last you for a very, very long time. Um, it doesn't go moldy as long as you um, keep it sealed tight. Can I see that cheese shredder you use again? Absolutely. One of my all-time favorite tools, it's a microplane. I use it to zest um, my lemons. I use it to zest um, nutmeg. And for grating um, Parmesan, I also have the little hand wheel for grating Parmesan as well but I tend not to use it too often. This one, I, I tend to use this one. It's called a microplane and it's a fine zest grater. And they last a long too, they stay sharp. One of my all time favorites. Okay, so Corrine said, I've never used spaghetti squash. Very anxious to try it. I felt the exact same way. I, you know, I had never really used it. I think I'd made it years ago and just, I kind of forgot about it. And then when my husband made this meal for us, I'm like, why am I not using this more? And, you know, I don't know, John, sorry for me saying this, but when you're menopausal, you start to gain weight in different places than you're used to. And so you kind of start to, sorry, John, <laughs> but you start to watch, you know, what you're eating a little bit closer. And I think this is, a great swap for hundreds of calories um, that you, you know, in a given meal. And so I fell in love with it and have used it in so many different things. So I hope you guys do too. And that might have been TMI. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see. How do we blacken the peppers in the oven? Okay. So, John, um, I'm not sure if, are you, did you try to blacken your peppers yet? might have been delayed no no i didn't i'm still using i'm still uh have the squash in the oven so that's tied up for an, another half hour still okay so you can do your peppers one of two ways the first way that i mentioned is the longest way but i'll give you a quick way to do it that will yield the exact same result as doing it over the flame so the first way is you can slice them in half and you don't have to remove the seeds or anything. And so you're gonna face them down, cook them for 20 minutes. At 375, you can do 400 as well, but set your timer for 20 minutes. Then you're gonna flip them and put it on for an additional 20 minutes. If you're doing the higher heat of 400, you may not have to cook it the additional 20 minutes. Just check it maybe after 10 and see how soft it is. Um, and judge it based on the softness. So that's one way to do it, just on a regular sheet pan. The other quick way, which is perfect for what John mentioned, he's like, my oven's tied up and my squash is in the oven right now, so I can't really you know, do that. So when it comes out of the oven, your squash, um, put on your broiler. And then um, you wanna keep it, don't put it, your peppers too close because then what's going to happen, it will char the outside, but it won't cook the pepper, if that makes sense. So it'll be a hard pepper. And so put it down about, oh, it's typically, I'm looking at my hands here, six to eight inches at least from the broiler. Broilers are usually on top um, for the most part in most ovens. Um, so make sure there's a good distance of six to eight inches between the pepper and your broiler and just broil them and they'll start to char and you'll just have to flip them on four sides. And that can take up to maybe eight to 10 minutes at best. 
and you'll be done. And then you can um, wrap them in the paper towels, just like I told you about. And you're looking for that dark, charred, um, blackened outer skin layer of that pepper. And that's where all that flavor is. So I hope I got that question answered for you. Let's see here. Oh, the fresh carrots. Oh, I see, Susan. Sorry, I misread what you said. The fresh, I thought you were talking about a brand. The fresh carrot tops on the carrots for pesto. Oh, that's a great idea. So do you slice up the ends of your carrots then, the greens, for making your pesto? Hopefully I got that right this time. As a substitute for like fresh basil is probably what you're referring to. That's a great one. I'm gonna have to try that. Next time, I think when we did Ray's class, we had those fresh carrots and I've been reaping the benefits of her matzo ball soup because she left the stock here. So I've been using that um, for the past few weeks and I've actually saved her a couple of jars because I didn't think it was right that I took all of her stock. So I hope to pay her back. Let's see here. Steve said, this is great. Thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. No, we, we really hope we're helping. I know it seems silly to everyone to show you something like this, but I also thought it was important just to show you the, the layers of flavor and if they're just super subtle, simple, what a, a, a difference maker, it's a change maker for any recipe. Maria said, this looks like an awesome meal. Susan, yes, she confirmed that using carrot tops for a pesto, I love that. And then Jess said, I just wanted to say that this is an awesome resource and a really enjoyable experience every time I'm learning so much. Also, I got all the stuff over the weekend to make the tomatilla sauce, salsa today, so I will let you know how it goes. Then I'll have to try the spaghetti sauce too. Awesome. Jess, it was so funny because I had never used tomatillas before. And so I was so proud when I walked into the store. I felt very confident after Jess teaching us where to find them. And they're usually next to the jalapeno peppers and sure enough, there they were. And I brought them home and I made it up and I was thrilled and I had made some mango salsa um, for something else. And my daughter was saying, oh, wouldn't the tomatillas be good in there too? Because they're a unique flavor, not quite tomato, not quite lime. It's kind of a, a, a sharp kind of soury, sweet flavor. Um, but yeah, it, it's so fun to learn something new and to try new things that you wouldn't typically try. So that was so fun to have uh, Jessica here teaching us that. Oh yes, actually Jess just said that she saw that you can roast the tomatillas. I think that would be great as well. And to add that extra layer of you know flavor to the dish, absolutely. Yeah, you guys are giving me lots of ideas with the carrot tops and now the roasted tomatillas and the roasted tomatoes. And actually, I wanted to share with you guys um, my favorite type of tomatoes that I use. Um, if I'm not buying fresh tomatoes, I typically will buy, um, and now it's, uh, they're San Marzano, um, Italian, uh, made from Italy tomatoes. They're in a yellow can. They're 24 ounces. Um, it's only what I make tomato soup with. I wanted to share the tomato soup with you guys over the winter and I, we just didn't get to it. But, um, and I was gonna show you these canned tomatoes. You'll never go back to anything else. I don't know if anyone else has tried them. I see Patty shaking her head. They're not acidic and they're just amazing and it's a game changer and remember you guys there's no there's no endorsements or ads i don't try to sell you anything on these share classes i'm just sharing the things that after trial and error of getting one bit maybe i didn't even know too that canned tomatoes can be off in taste maybe it's not until you discover one that says, wow, this is different and made things so much better that you realize that, oh, wow, there really is a difference in taste. And so I highly recommend it. I think they're um, 
someone correct me if I'm wrong. I know it's a yellow can. I think it's Centos and it will say San Marzano made from Italy. Look very closely for the made from Italy or um, it says something to that reference right under San Marzano. It's usually on a bottom shelf. Um, they're not going to be eye level. So you've got to search, but Walmart carries them. Um, any grocery store pretty much carries them too. But they're a game changer for sure. We'll see what else. I can email you. Oh, I see. Okay, so Melissa's going to send out that recipe from last week. And I think they'll up, be up on the library's website too, all, all the recipes and share class as well. But thanks, Melissa, for taking care of that. And then John said the matzo balls didn't stay together real well. Should I have hand compressed the dough balls after using the cookie scoop to get the amount of dough? Well, that's certainly interesting that they didn't stay together. Um, right off the bat, I'm thinking, Definitely how you compact them after scooping them out could make a difference. Um, did you store them in the refrigerator as well, John? Yeah, it's been only about 30 minutes. Only and about... longer refrigeration might help too. Yeah, and you know, I'm even thinking that day that we made them with Ray, I want to say we left ours in for only about 20 minutes. And so I'm curious, I will ask her because she has made that, you know, recipe pretty consistently. So let me ask her and I will let you know and see if she has any suggestions for that. It, it was still great. It was just, I had a lot of matzo that did not stay in a ball after mm -hmm. I took them out. Okay, I will ask her and see what she says. Because that was my first time with matzo ball soup as well. And so that was fun. And that was one of those dishes too that it was all those subtle little flavors all the way down to that last little sprinkle of fresh parsley that makes all the difference. And so I, I hope that, you know, what these classes are doing is teaching you guys to be able to look at recipes that you see online and scanning them for what flavors are in there and see how it could come together for a good recipe or a not so good recipe. And so I hope it's inspiring you you all <laughs> as my guest. And I just noticed I went 10 minutes over and I had no idea. I thought I would be short today. I just realized that. But thanks, you guys. I hope you give spaghetti squash a try. If not for the health benefits, then certainly just for something new to add to your repertoire that's simple for dinner. Um, I love having you guys join every week. Um, I'm going to be talking to Melissa. The next two weeks, we're going to be taking off. So there won't be share classes for the next two weeks, but it will pick up May 1st, um, that first Monday. I think it's May 1st, if I remember right. And I am really hoping I inspire you guys to start a little garden. That's going to be our next class. And um, we're going to just start with some basic small herbs. And I want to teach you the tricks that I learned years ago. And I've told you before, I don't do a thing with my herb garden, but I want to inspire you to give it a shot. And that's the perfect time of year to do it. So that's what we're going to start with and we'll move on from there. Um, so we will see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Corrine. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Jess and Susan and John. Of course, Melissa. Thank Let's you see. and goodbye. Bye, John. And Maria and Elaine and Mary. Thanks, you guys. I just noticed there's a delay. Melissa, can you see a delay on the camera?